All right. Thank you very much for the invitation and the possibility to speak. Um, speak here. I'm going to talk about high frequency ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging in vascular research. Let's see if this. I would like to highlight also a little bit or right away the translation aspect from non-invasive real-time imaging in vivo from going from mouse to man. And those first three parts, I think, are for all of us, like interrupt me, challenge me at any time during the presentation, afterwards discuss. The last point is just to remember for me that I'm here to learn from you to get impact input on where to go next where is research uh, going. So for the vascular imaging on a vivo system, you have multiple possibilities. So you can do a regular B-mode grayscale, as you know, with advanced post-processing, with the help of Doppler techniques. You can look at vessels, vascular flow, with contrast agent, go to capillaries. And then as Francesco briefly introduced before, with photoacoustics, you can take it down even notch more and go to nanostructures. Now, the core of, for the user, still remains this imaging station helping in standardizing protocols and standardizing protocol across different imaging labs. Anything that involves physiological and functional measurements, really important, as discussed yesterday. Have a look at the animal physiology and do whatever it takes to keep it maintained at a constant level. Now, Yesterday's talks focused on, on the heart. And the heart, yes, it's a central organ. It's absolutely essential to look at it. But sometimes cardiac function or cardiac dysfunction may not be because something is wrong with the heart, but because something is wrong in the periphery. Periphery meaning the main arteries, smaller arteries, arterioles, and down to the capillary network. So one of the first examples I'd like to use for this is a model for pulmonary hypertension. So you do have right ventricular dysfunction, but something is actually wrong outside of the heart. And good way of looking at pulmonary hypertension, oh, that's uh, just a 4D acquisition looking at torsion in apex and base of the heart as they will change during disease. But for pulmonary hypertension, what you can do non-invasively without putting a, a pressure catheter in is looking what's going on in the right ventricle and you're able to differentiate chronic from and induced <coughs> pulmonary hypertension from um, wild type and healthy animals purely based on looking at the pulmonary artery and getting a Doppler and doing, for example, pulmonary acceleration time or ratio acceleration to ejection time to normalize for heart rates. So fast and non-invasive way of looking at what's wrong in the periphery. With the ultrasound, if you uh, change this position just a little bit, you can even differentiate left and right pulmonary artery, so what's going on in the lung. Another model we've talked about yesterday with, has an impact, which has an impact on the heart is a trans constriction model. So just by tying off <coughs> in the aortic arch, you increase hypertrophy, but you need to assess what's going on in the vessel itself. And we've had discussions about Doppler yesterday. So I added this slide. It's um, took the phone from Dr. Perani in Milan. That randomization done by assessing the flow through the stenosis, where in a healthy animal you have 0 0.8 to 1.2 roughly meters per second. And then through the stenosis, 3, 4, sometimes over 5 meters per second. And you are able to assess this flow, look also at turbulence versus laminar flow, and thereby randomize the animals. And the remodeling that you've seen before, that's a result of what's going on wrong in the peripheral vasculature. Now, once we tie off here, or almost tied off in the aortic arch, you have a lot of high pressure. So yes, you can look at the croid arteries, more about that soon. But you can also look at the aortic valve itself and look what this high pressure does to the aortic valve and look at the aortic valve insufficiency, detect and measure. A key thing to remember, 
And this is again um, a slide I took from, from Milan. Be aware of which animal model you're using. As for a tuck model, sham surgery, and then two different subtypes of black six, one which develops a phenotype, the other doesn't. So it's important to look at the flow itself, randomize the animals, and if something happens, the experiment worked. Careful which subtypes you use. If someone is a black six, have a look at the subtype to compare data. So again, standardization. So moving a little bit further away from the heart, more to main arteries. So I don't know if any one of you works with um, aneurysms, induced aneurysms. So you can look at them in 2D, 3D, assess diameter of um, the abdominal artery in that case, so in the longitudinal section. Look at the aneurysm, assess the volume of the aneurysm. And the nice part, as you know about the ultrasound, it does correlate very nicely to what you can do ex vivo. <coughs> There are posters out there about atherosclerosis. So very briefly, looking at that case, aortic arch, plug formation, identify plug. Again, has been shown to correlate with histology in the measurements, in, the in linear measurements. But if you add a 3D, you go then to true quantification. So length, diameter, etc. But a 3D scan will give you total plug burden. Now that you draw the aortic arch to it, that's a, a nice A-level course, but the important part is detection of plug through quantification of, of the volume. Before you see formation of plug or early onset of arthroscopic disease, it does pay off to have a look at carotid arteries, for example. And there's a very nice study done from, from Gothenburg looking at carotid arteries um, in APOE mice and correlating strain to plug burden. And then they did the same with patients and found the same correlation. So a nice validation of the model, of the APE model, but also of the importance of looking at vascular strain in patients as well as in animals. So again, highlighting the translational part. Now when we move from the larger arteries that are clearly identifiable with a regular grayscale scan to smaller, where the resolution may just not be high enough, you can move to Doppler modes. Doppler on the brain, in that case with the help of the craniotomy, or in tumors to see how the vessels, the established vascularity grows over time. That can help in identification of tumors, how tumors grow over time, how the established vasculature changes. If you want to go even smaller, then Doppler itself will not be able to pick up the small faint signal in the arteries, uh, sorry, in the capillaries, which means we have to resort to dedicated contrast agents, which is made for high frequency ultrasound. And what can be done is, and you look at capillary flow, you can do that in tumors, you can look at uh, vasorosorum around plugs. But you can also look at for the myocardium. So the next move I'm going to show you is a long axis of the heart, contrast agent injected intravenously, so through the inferior vena cava, right ventricle, pulmonary artery first, and then filling off the left ventricle and the myocardium itself. So this movie is gated for respiration and ECG, so the heart itself looks stable, not moving all too much. Contrast agent, pulmonary artery, filling the left ventricle, and the entire myocardium. Now we've tested it as well with an LED, just like getting a coronary, and then we, see, we saw a drop of the contrast uh, signal in the apical region. It was a reperfusion model, so we released the ligation again, and could see that the entire myocardium got reperfused. So this could help in assessing um, infarction size. Haven't tried it yet, um, but if you link this to a 3D gated, maybe this could lead to true quantification of infarction. What's nice about the contrast agent is that it correlates to histology. In that case, it's a breast cancer. 
What is important, if you do a correlation in vivo versus ex vivo, don't just do a CD31 or any vascular marker staining and look in histology. Because with the contrast agent, especially in oncology that's true, we look for functional blood vessels. Whereas if you do histology, you look for presence of any kind of blood vessels. So careful what you compare. Um, this correlation was done by injection, inject, injecting Texas red linked to dextrin, so that only the functional vessels uh, were compared to what's with the ultrasound. So combining a 2D, a 3D vessels with contrast agent diffusion rounds up a very nice, a, a complete study. With the contrast agent, also validated with histology, you can do molecular imaging. So you look at endothelial cell surface marker expression. And it's a very nice study uh, done in Orléans, uh, Le Pub's lab. They've made it a brand, they made a brand new tumor volume, a uh, tumor model, lung cancer. Lung cancer is probably not the strong suit of, for ultrasound imaging. However, in their model, the volume they detect in vivo correlates with the CT uh, and the ex vivo. They're able to look at perfusion of the lung tumor, VGF expression, so the angiogenic, angiogenic potential, and then, as Francesco introduced before, with the help of photoacoustics, not only delineate the tumor volume, but outline the hypoxic core, the volume of low oxygen or hypoxia inside the tumor. So going just a, a notch further, and for this, no contrast agent needs to be injected because the blood can serve as a contrast agent. That brings me to what is photoacoustics. How many of you have heard about it? Well, I probably shouldn't expend too much time then on the explanation. For those who, who haven't, <laughs> basic setup, you have an ultrasound transducer, and this setup actually has just been modified. So in the afternoon, I hope you can see the latest redesign of this approach. Ultrasound signal and fiber optic cable with a pulse laser of a defined desired wavelength, so you can tune it and adjust it yourself as a user. Then optical, so the laser light is pulsed into the tissue, and if you have an absorber absorbing a specific wavelength, a sound wave is created through a thermoelastic expansion. So the energy is taken up from the light and emitted as sound. And you have different contrast agents. You have the blood, you can differentiate a heme group with or without oxygen, nanoparticles, melanin, and also clinically approved agents such as methyl and blue or uh, IRI 800. They can absorb at defined wavelength the light and then emit a sound wave which this transducer is designed to detect. So if someone asks you what is photoacoustics, the basic answer, the quick short answer is you send light in and detect the sound that's coming back. So, little commercial input in, in here. That's the latest design. So, ultra-frequency ultrasound, and here, the Vive Laser X, a second system, fully integrated and operated on this touch panel. Wide range of wavelengths <coughs> going, allowing you now to go into, further into the infrared, and lipid detection. It's also the first um, laser that you can use as a class four. This means that in the class one setting, you have in the lab, you close a door um, with the, where the imaging station is in, inside, and you can image as you want to go. In the class four, you do, do not need the enclosure. You need a laser safety lab, etc., or you work with goggles, which makes this a very nice translatable, clinically translatable approach. So, and I come to that clinical translate, <coughs> translatable soon. So, before I show you already on oncology, detection of tumor, assessing oxygenation, and then looking at volume as it changes, and also the oxygenated volume as that changes over time. So, you can look at response to therapy, a lot earlier than you see a volumetric change. 
11 for oxygenation has been compared with uh, the clinical golden standard, the blood oxygen dependent MRI, gold MRI. They correlate nicely. The photoacoustic imaging was, had a higher sensitivity than the gold MRI in the now setting. What's new with the photoacoustics is that you now can use this approach to look at the heart. With the proper setup of the animal, you image the heart in the regular grayscale and at the same time with photoacoustics. So now you may see, think like, well, this is just red, I don't see anything. Which is good. Because what we're looking here is blood absorber. If you had big holes in there that are not red, it means there's absence of blood. So now we do have blood in the myocardium, but also in the ventricle. So all of this needs to be read. That's the key thing about the photoacoustic approach from visual sonics, that you have this high resolution image and an inherent co-registration. So you draw your regions of interest based on the anatomy and you figure out the C corresponding signal. Looking at oxygenation, again, all colored because it's blood everywhere. The higher, the more to the red you go, the higher the level of oxygenation. The more from the white, blue to black you go, the lower the oxygenation. But a very nice setup is that you do an oxygen challenge to the animal as you're doing the imaging, so in real time. From 80% oxygen, drop to five, and then go back up to 80%, and you will see that the oxygenation will drop, and as you give the animal back the 80%, it will increase again. So you can do absolute oxygen levels, but you can also do the kinetics as the oxygenation drops and reappears. So instead of doing an ischemia reperfusion model, induce some kind of ischemia by the level of oxygen the animal is breathing. How many of you are doing brain neuroimaging or have interest in that? Good, because that's something we put more emphasis on these days as well. Has been shown before that you, with a contrast agent, you can get really nice imaging images of the brain, looking at uh, stimulation. This is a, a, a whisker stimulation to see which areas of the brain respond with vasodilation. <coughs> Works fantastic. Downside is the craniotomy to really get the nicest of images. Now, with integrating of a stereotactic frame, so we've miniaturize this to connect to the imaging station. Also include um, a mouse brain atlas based on a stereotactic frame. System knows where you are, so you can do comparison. And you can then do regular grayscale imaging and as well as Doppler or photoacoustic imaging on the brain. So this is ex vivo, pretty much what you get in histology. And when you move to the in vivo setting, you lose a bit of this inner grayscale, but skull and skin are intact. The next um, part I'd like to show you is a publication from stroke. Induced a temporal stroke ischemia by ligate into choroid artery, releasing it again, and then assessing what's going on in the brain. The real nice part about this study is that it's a behavioral study. They looked at how that is scheme, temporal scheme that impairs the learning capabilities. So highlighting minimal invasive or the non-invasiveness of the procedure, the most invasive part was actually doing, doing the surgery and the ligation. <coughs> so let's have a look at the movie. Yeah, there it is. So a temporary ligation of the carotid, drawing multiple regions of interest in a cross-section of the brain with Doppler, see that one hemisphere completely dropped in the Doppler signal, but then with circular villus, etc., you don't have complete ischemia, you have hypoxia. And then, over time, ligating, given an oxygen challenge, releasing, you will see how the hemispheres, or in that case, these two areas, respond differently in terms of time, so the kinetics are different, and then also the absolute levels are different. And as always, a nice correlation to what's going on 
ex vivo. Taking it to the next step. It's great to work in mice, but in all the grants and all your presentations highlight the importance of taking this to the clinic and the clinical potential of your findings. Same for the ultra frequency ultrasound. So based on requests by users that used the Vivo and then with local ethical approval did some clinical research, we now have the Vivo MD here. And what can be done? As Francesco had nicely before, looking at that's blood vessels, peripheral arteries, which with conventional ultrasound could not really be could be imaged, but you cannot get the detail really from the wall and as the wall <coughs> and how the wall responds to either injury, pressure changes, diseases such as chronic kidney disease, which has been nicely published, or the impact atherosclerosis, etc. As for injuries, um, a study done in, in Rotterdam, radar study of radial artery access to see complications that can be associated with radial artery and how you can monitor and detect them and the value of using ultra high frequency to guide your needle in. In the adult setting, as here, often you can feel a pulse. In a critically ill patient with the pulse, not so easy, imaging helps. But if you go to an infant or neonate setting, this becomes really crucial to find the vessel. Don't try and stick. For looking at the wall in more detail, nice study showing that the radial intima media, only assessed with the ultra high frequencies, actually has a predictive value in a subset of patients. So based on discussion yesterday, I added this for like, okay, technology moves forward, that's great, but what's the clinical application? So that's, that's one of these things. Has also been correlated to the radial artery uh, intima media or intima to media ratio, which I wasn't, been, no one was able to do before. It correlates to what you could get with uh, a skintigram or an angiogram in terms of blood burden. Small repetition from Francesco um, looking at a finger and different absorption of the light, you can get different uh, separate signal in that case from the skin, the melanin, from the blood. This knowledge we took to the next level and we had an in-house physically healthy volunteer. We induced some ischemia, temporal ischemia in the finger, just to show like, yes, we can detect a drop in oxygen. Since we detect hemoglobin with and without him, um, oxygen to it, you not only detect what's the level of oxygen, but what's the level of blood. A pulse oximeter, for example, will give you oxygen, but not how much blood there is. And knowing this, moved to a, a first clinical ex experiment under local ethical approval. In that case, um, using a spray to temporarily increase oxygenation of the skin. Great application in, in, in wound healing, for example, skin transplantations, etc., which show that over time, the oxygenation temporarily increased and with prolonged time, it dropped again, so you have to reapply a spray. So very nice clinical application of handheld transducer, just safety goggles, scanned through, combined with the 3D so, in conclusion, the ultra-high frequencies have great potential in vascular research, and your talks are great testimony to that. For detection of blood, vessel thickness, uh, the plug, the, the vessel wall thickness, mouse and man, great translational um, capabilities. And some publications refer to it as in vivo histology, as you can get histological detail in the living animal. And we are having some, there are a few studies coming up fairly soon, making this correlation histology also in, in man. With that, I thank you for your attention. I hope you have a lot of questions.